Good afternoon, everybody, or good morning, maybe, where you are, but welcome. Thank you for joining us today for Intro to Edging. Uh, today, we're going to cover an introduction to landscape edging and restraint systems, including the importance of edging and why you want to include it on all of your projects. We're also going to cover a number of applications that edging is used on in the landscape and also in hardscape construction and in the green building environment. This presentation is put together and sponsored by Permalock, the world's leading manufacturer and the expert on all things edging. My name is Daniel Martin. I'm the director of marketing here at Permalock Corporation and will be your host for today. So again, thank you very much for joining us and let's go ahead and get started. All right, let's, there we go. All right, the, uh, the first thing we want to discuss, oh, I went out of that, I meant to go to the next thing. Sorry about that, bear with me here. Aha, I see the problem. Correcting it now. <laughs> Technology, good stuff. All right, here we go, all right. So the first thing we want to talk about uh, before we get into applications and materials, et cetera, is sustainability in the landscape. Uh, that's something that's very important and something that edging helps with dramatically. Uh, so what does sustainability in the landscape mean exactly? Well, sustainable landscapes are responsive to the environment, they're regenerative, and they can actively contribute to the development of healthy communities. Also, sustainable landscapes sequester carbon, clean the air and water, increase energy efficiency, restore habitats, and create value through significant economic, social, and environmental benefits, commonly referred to as the triple bottom line. So what goes into accomplishing a sustainable landscape? Well, to accomplish it, you must be thoughtful, and strict on the design and product selection for the project. The durability and longevity of the products that are selected, as well as the environmental benefits of the products are important. Sustainable measurement tools such as LEED and SITES, you may have heard of those, they take into account what they call the life cycle assessment to evaluate the sustainability of a product. That basically boils down to what is made of to what the product is made of and how long it will last. So the big question to answer here uh, in intro to edging is why use edging? Why is it important? Why do you want it on your project? For this presentation, we're gonna boil that down to three key reasons and you can see them here. First, we want to maintain the designer's original intent for the look of the landscape. When a landscape architect or designer sits down and draws a plan, there are very specific reasons for the way the lines are drawn. Whether those reasons are for form and looks only, or whether they're for functional and structural in nature, it is important that the project looks and performs the same on day one as in the year 35. You know, if it's there for 50 years, you want it to look exactly the same as when it started. For instance, if a certain curve line is drawn for a landscape bed, the edging will maintain the line exactly as it was drawn. Without edging, the bed would grow or change shape each time it was spade cut, or it would completely disappear if it were not maintained at all. All right, next, putting edging on the project just makes it look better. As the human eye looks across a landscape, Clean lines and true separation of adjacent materials increases the visual appeal. The level of visual aesthetics is increased with edging. Additionally, the project will continue to look its best when materials are contained. Brick paver areas stay tight and clean. Mulch is not swept away into areas that it shouldn't be. Everything remains orderly and tight. Just looks better. All right, and the last reason we'll look at edging on a project is for cost savings. The cost savings come in long-term maintenance expenses. Crews will not have to go back out and reset pavers. Someone will not need to return multiple times a year to spade cut a bed line. 
All of these things add up to a considerable savings for the project owner over the lifetime of the project. All right, so now let's look at some application specific edgings. Uh, it's important for you to know that edging is not a one size fits all product. There are literally hundreds of shapes and sizes of edging and the product choice depends completely on what the application is or what the edging is intended to do. There are many applications that require edging. Uh, if you think of anywhere in a landscape that two different materials or textures meet, that's a place where edging could and should be used. Again, each application can require a different shape, height, thickness, or even color of edging. Stop one second. All right, just admitted a couple people in here. Sorry uh, for things that you missed. Uh, we will make this uh, available for public viewing as well. Um, Mostly we just talked introduction so far. Um, but let's, uh, let's keep going now. We're talking about uh, how edging is application specific. So many applications require edging. Um, if you think of anywhere in a landscape uh, where two different materials meet, edging can go there and should go there. Um, different heights, shapes, thicknesses, even colors of edging can be required. my sorry guys I lost my mouse here we go uh, the more that you can know about various applications looking at the bottom point here uh, how they work what they're for what materials are involved the easier it will be for you to select the proper edging and restraint system for you to use on the installation all right so now we're going to look at some different applications, some of the more popular applications that exist. Uh, keep in mind that each project you work on could have multiple applications on it, requiring the use of a variety of edgings. Uh, this image we're showing here shows one single project that has six different applications on it. From the roof to the building's edge to the landscape, walkways, driveways. We're gonna look at each of these six applications separately. And we're also gonna cover two additional popular applications that, that weren't used in this picture. But looking at this project, each of these is a completely different type of edging. All right, so first let's take a look at landscape beds. Uh, this is the most recognized and popular use for landscape edgings. Uh, most people when they think landscape edging, this is the type of thing they're thinking of. Uh, edging can be used here to separate turf from planting soil, from mulch, stone, glass collet, any other bedding material. Uh, you can see in the image here that we're just separating some ground cover from turf. As you can see here in this 3D rendering, a flat edging is the best choice for landscape beds. Uh, this allows the edging to flex and create the curves that are usually required for this application. Stake pockets along the outside of the edging allow for a stake to be driven into the soil to hold the edging in place. You can see that here in the image. Uh, and a method for connecting each adjacent edging section together is necessary to prevent separation at the joints. Looking at these images, you can see you know, a basic uh, landscape bed. But let's look at what a uh, typical piece of bed edging or flat edging would look like. Um, this is a, a small cutting of a four inch edging, so that's four inches tall. And it is, uh, this one is one eighth of an inch thick. Uh, so you can see nice slim profile, separates on each side uh, the different materials. And in this piece, you can't uh, tell because of the size, but this would be very flexible to allow for, for smooth and graceful curves. So it can bow and it can flex. And then a stake that would stake into it on the side. All right, so that is a landscape bed. Now let's move on to our next application. Uh, which is a maintenance strip. 
Uh, so maintenance strip is an area along a building, fence, or structure typically filled with stone. This area eases the burden of lawn maintenance for the area by preventing grass from growing right along the structure. So no need to come along then and weed whack along the building because the mower won't cut that close. Uh, also is commonly referred to as a drip strip because it provides an area for water to drip from the rooftop without creating muddy areas along the side. So in this type of application, pin straight lines are usually desired. Um, this creates a nice parallel line along the structure. So if the line has waves in it, the eye picks up on that as a negative. So the pin straight is incredibly important here. Let's look a little deeper into uh, maintenance strips. You can see in these pictures, the straight lines along the fence and the building, uh, creating a nice parallel, um, greatly reduces the need to maintain lawn maintenance against these structures. In the rendering, you can see the difference between this edging and the landscape bed edging we just looked at. Uh, a small foot or return on the bottom of the edging allows the entire length of this edging to remain completely rigid. Uh, allows for perfectly straight lines with no curves, waves, or tangents, which is exactly what you're looking for in this type of environment. A side benefit to the foot is that the typical stone used in these applications will rest on top of that foot and help keep everything in the ground and in place. Um, the same loops and staking system is used on here to keep the edging uh, in the ground and in place. I'm going to show you a quick demo of what a maintenance strip edging might look like. Uh, you can see, you know, if we look at it this way, very, very similar to the edging that we just looked at for flat beds, but, or for landscape beds, but when you turn it, you can see this foot on here that is going to keep it perfectly straight and allow stone to sit on here so that it'll also help keep it from coming out of the ground. And that is a uh, maintenance strip. All right, so let's uh, move right on to our next application. And this is going to be an aggregate walkway. Um, so aggregate walkways typically uh, are used for winding paths uh, or pathways that are filled with some type of aggregate, whether that be a stone, or pea gravel, a decomposed granite, uh, crushed shells, so lots of options here that can be used. Um, but these walkways often have a compacted sub-base underneath the aggregate. Um, but many times they can just be put on top of a native soil. So, you know, a couple construction methods here that can be used. Uh, so let's take a look at one of these methods. We're going to look at uh, on top of a compacted base. Uh, so that's kind of the most common, especially in, in public uh, settings, parks, um, things like that. In a residential uh, setting, it might just be on a native soil. But in this instance, on a compacted base, um, the method allows for an L-shaped edging to be spiked into place. Uh, the spike is driven through holes in the base of the edging. Typically, it's a 10-inch spiral steel spike is used. Uh, this creates a maximum holding power as that spiral allows the stake to bite into that compacted base and not come out. And the edging rests on top of the compacted base. The aggregate is placed on top of the edging. Uh, this provides a nice clean edge, keeps the aggregate in place, and it means it doesn't need to be topped off every year because it's not washing out into adjacent materials. Uh, also allows turf to grow adjacent to the aggregate with no dead spots due to wash off. The L-shaped edging typically has V-notches stamped into the base. You can see a little bit of that in this 3D rendering. Um, these V-notches allow for curves and angles to be formed. Uh, and in cases where there's not a compacted base under the aggregate, the edging and insulation could be similar to what we looked at for landscape beds or maintenance strips, uh, possibly a maintenance strip with a little foot that could uh, have the aggregate rest on it. Um, and the stake would hold the edging in place since there's no compaction to spike into. Uh, we're gonna look at a sample of this L-shaped edging, uh, something similar that you might use, uh, large L, uh, V-notch base we talked about that will allow for some curves to be formed. And we'll look at this a little more in some other applications as well. 
Okay, let's move on here to our next application, but I think we've got uh, a couple more people here joining us. Uh, welcome to those of you who are just joining. Um, you've missed a little bit, but we uh, are recording this and we will make it available publicly uh, through some of our social media channels on our website so you can catch up on those things that you missed. Um, but now we will continue. I will say to all of you as well who are here, if you have questions at any time, you can hit the little raise hand um, icon and we will get to as many of your questions as we can as well. Okay, so we just finished talking about uh, one of the applications here, uh, aggregate walkways, and we are gonna move on to our next application, uh, which is going to be brick pavers. Um, Brick pavers is one of the most common applications for edging and restraint systems. Um, pavers continually increase in popularity for patios, pool areas, driveways, walkways, and even entire public plazas. Uh, more and more becoming common uh, as opposed to concrete or asphalt, uh, just for the aesthetic look of them and the ease of repair. Um, variety of shapes and colors, you know, help uh, contribute to that, make it a design element that uh, designers are enjoying to use. Uh, the pavers themselves can be made of concrete, clay, rubber, or any number of other materials. But edging of some sort is almost mandatory on a paver project to keep the pavers in place. It is a structural requirement that the pavers not drift. So let's look at what this paver application uh, looks like. Uh, with the rendering here. Uh, here you can see the photos of a couple of paver installations. Um, both of these are, are just simple walkways. One is residential, one is in a public park. But in the 3D rendering, you can see that this application looks very similar to the aggregate walkway application we just looked at. Uh, uses an L-shaped paver that is spiked, or L-shaped restraint, I'm sorry, that is uh, spiked into a compacted base. So on top of the edging, you can see a small layer of setting sand, and then the paver is placed on top of that. And what the setting sand does, it allows the pavers to be leveled so you have a tidy, safe pavement um, that people can walk on. So it's important to note that the ideal edging height for a paver application is about halfway up the paver. So this is high enough to prevent the pavers from moving laterally yet low enough that it's not visible once adjacent material is in place. So, so your grass and your adjacent soil is gonna cover up that restraint, but it's going to do its job in holding the pavers and the setting sand in place for a nice strong application that will last for years. All right, so we, uh, we've looked at some, some paver restraints. There's a lot of different kinds, but uh, typically, again, it's L-shaped. It's going to have some sort of a base in it that will allow it to be able to form curves and angles. And the pavers are going to set here or here. It can go either way and hold everything in place. Nice and sturdy, but very low profile. And the low profile is important because that's going to allow your grass to grow right up to the pavers without any dead spots because the roots are going to get deep and strong. So that's a uh, brick paver. Now let's move on to our next application. And very similar, in fact, uh, on the surface, uh, it might seem exactly the same as the last one we looked at, but underneath it's fundamentally quite different. There's a, a big difference in the way these products work. So permeable pavers are important for green building applications because um, they allow water to pass through them and return to the ground instead of running off the top of the pavers into the drainage system, which can cause uh, combined sewer overflows, things like that that might have negative environmental impact. Um, so the abundance of stormwater is taken care of because it's not running off, it's running down through the pavers and into the, uh, the, into the soil, into the ground plane. All right, so let's see what this looks like and how these are fundamentally different than brick pavers. 
Uh, you can see a walkway and a driveway here, um, like we mentioned, looks very, very similar to the standard pavers we looked at. However, if you look at the rendering, you can see the construction method is quite different. Uh, instead of having sand and a compacted base under the pavers, there is a setting course of chipstone over an open grade base with 57 stone that allows the water to pass through. So you've got this big open area of large stone so the water can go through it and rest in it. And then you've got an area of much smaller stone sitting on top of that. And the pavers sit on that smaller stone, very similar to what the sand did in the brick paver application we looked at to level and balance the pavers so that on top they look nice and smooth and, uh, and are safe. Um, so these pavers uh, also have a gap between them that is filled with the same chipstone and this allows the water to move right between the pavers below the surface and continue down. And the open grade here, because of that, it prevents a spike from being used. So in a compacted base, the spike goes in, it sticks, everything holds in place. But this open grade, the spike would pop right back out, which created a problem for contractors who were looking to install permeable pavers. Uh, they had a few choices. They could either adjacent to the open grade, bring in compacted material and compact it, or they could pour a concrete curb but we came up with a system. There's a, a new system that ICPI has recognized uh, that uses a geotextile. Uh, so this geogrid textile is placed between two layers of stone, which creates a friction-bound plane. So now that geotextile cannot be pulled out because uh, it has a high degree of pull-out resistance. And then a capture plate is used to affix the edging to the geogrid. So basically this geotextile is being sandwiched between your edging and a capture plate. And this prevents the edging from now being pulled out because it is part of that friction bound geogrid material. And what's great about this feature is now when you load the pavement uh, in a typical paver application, when say a vehicle drives on top of that paver, it's going to push the edging away. So you need a good base and your Spike needs to hold well to keep that in place. But with this system, as you load those pavers, it pushes down on that geo grid and it actually draws the edging into the pavers, creating an even stronger system than traditional pavers. Um, let's see, we're gonna show you what one of those look like, but we will, uh, we'll just jump ahead. Um, but basically you're looking at a three inch by 10 inch plate in that drawing. Um, those are put every couple of feet and they are held attached to the edging with a self tapping screw that captures that geotextile. Um, anybody who is here and would like samples, um, you can reach out to us. You can, you can hit us up in the, con in the comments here or we will also, um, you can email us at sales at permalock.com and we can get you samples of any of these kind of materials you'd like as well. All right, let's uh, keep moving right along here. Gonna look at some more hardscape stuff. Uh, so next along is asphalt surface. Um, so this is one people probably think, you know, why would we need edging on asphalt? Um, and we're going to kind of get into that. It's a, it's a unique application, but uh, very important. Because um, lots of times, you know, we talked about pavers are kind of the desired look for aesthetics and stuff, but sometimes the budget just doesn't allow for it, or, you know, there's just miles and miles of paths, something like that. Um, so asphalt is called for because of these budgetary constraints. Um, but We've all seen asphalt, we've driven down the road, looked at the side of the road. Uh, asphalt's notorious for having rough, broken edges that can be an eyesore, especially if you put them in a professional landscape. Um, and that's why it's important to add a restraint system. Uh, when you get that edging on there, it's gonna prevent breaking and cracking along the edges. Uh, and it's gonna allow for a well-defined edge that looks good. So not only is your asphalt going to look better, but it's also going to last longer, which is really what edging is all about, making things last longer and look better for long periods of time. 
Okay, let's look at the uh, rendering of asphalt here. Um, so you can see here a couple asphalt paths. Um, you can notice how the green grass grows right up against that uh, well-defined edge uh, along the edge of the asphalt, um, which is very important. Um, and you can see in the drawing, again, this is very similar to some of the other applications we've already looked at. Uh, the L-shaped edging, is spiked into the compacted base and using that same spiral spike. So it's going to uh, be a nice firm anchoring of the edging. Uh, so the difference here is instead of putting, as, uh, putting aggregate or sand and pavers on top of this L shape, you're actually going to pour the hot asphalt directly on top of the base of the edge. So as your pavers come through, everything goes right on the edging and then is compacted down to be right even with the top of the restraint. So once that happens, as the asphalt hardens, it's going to actually harden around the lips and the channels that are in this edging and make it permanently attached. So there will be no separation along the border of the asphalt. The asphalt edge becomes part of, literally part of the asphalt where it cannot be separated. Uh, we've even seen it where they've gone back to pull asphalt up because they were going to you know, build a new building or do something and the asphalt edge restraint as they break up the asphalt and take it apart, the restraint stays connected to the asphalt along that last bit of the edging uh, or the installation. Um, so we're gonna look again, we had taken a look at the L-shaped restraint for aggregate, uh, again, showing the spike bowls, the V-notches that allow for curves. But you can see a little bit here, there is a tiny lip that runs along the edge of this base. And that is for asphalt, because as that asphalt gets compacted down, it's actually going to integrate with that foot and combine in with that. And it's gonna go into all of these little holes as it's compacted. And that's what makes this stay part of the asphalt, uh, even if the asphalt is torn up out of the ground. So again, not only are you using asphalt, maybe because of budgetary reasons, um, looking for a cheaper alternative method, but now by using this asphalt edge, that cheaper method is going to last a longer period of time because it's not going to crack. It's not going to um, break off at the edges and become an eyesore. And that's why we use, recommend using edging with asphalt. Okay, so our next application we want to talk to incredibly similar to asphalt, and that is a sport surface. Um, also, play surfaces, very similar. Uh, so, sport surfaces work the same way as asphalt, except the aggregate is bound with rubberized material to allow for less impact on knees and joints of the athletes uh, that are on the surface. Um, same method is used, like I said, for board and play surfaces on playgrounds and other play areas as well. So edging here, again, maintains a nice edge and strengthens the entire installation. The primary difference between this and the way asphalt edging works is that in uh, sports surface edging, there's a weep hole that's required along the edging to allow water to come out of that rubberized surface um, or else the water can become trapped in there, which could lead to damage um, from frost cycles, it could also lead to, to mold and things like that that could damage that rubberized surface. So it's important that the water is able to move out. Let's see what this looks like. It's going to look uh, very familiar. Uh, you see a sports surface, um, nice edge with the grass growing right up to it. And again, the primary difference here when you're looking at this rendering is that top bit is a rubberized surface. And here they've laid that rubberized surface over top of asphalt. That's often done because the asphalt is cheaper than the rubberized surface. So they just put a top coat of, of the sports surface on. Um, but this could be done in any combination. It could be all sports surface. It could be half and half, you know, any kind of mixture of that. Um, but it's done the same way where the surface is poured directly onto the edging and becomes an integral part of the installation. Um, you will see in the top, of this edging uh, in that top channel where that weep hole is that we previously mentioned. 
so by putting it up at the top, that allows water as it's coming into the surface to run right off to the edges and right out of the installation. And that's going to prevent any sort of damage that, uh, that may happen from accumulated water. Okay, we are cruising through here, um, coming up on, uh, I believe, our last application that we're going to really get into today, and that is uh, green roof. Uh, so as green building has become more and more popular, uh, it's been quite a movement across North America, especially in the last decade, uh, 15 years really, uh, green roofs have grown in popularity by leaps and bounds. Uh, so what is a green roof? It's simply the roof of a building that's been partially or completely covered with vegetation and growing media. So we're literally growing green on the roof. Um, this is all placed on top of the waterproof membrane, so it prevents leaks. Um, you know, the building is watertight, but you still have the stuff growing on top of it. So there are a lot of benefits to green roofs including environmental, social, and economic benefits. Uh, again, that triple bottom line that we discussed at the beginning. And if you're looking for more information about green roofs, uh, there are a number of sites where you can find out a lot about the benefits, um, including uh, Green Roofs for Healthy Cities website. They have a lot of information. But for now, we're gonna talk more about the construction methods of green roofs and the importance of edging on a green roof than, than the actual benefits of the roof itself. So let's look at a rendering here again. Uh, a couple pictures here, you know, you can see that these rooftops are being used for all kinds of things. You know, they're, they're livable space. You've got tables and, and barbecues and, you know, all sorts of places where people can hang out, which is part of the economical benefits. Uh, where you've got apartment complexes, condos, and big urban environments where now they're able to provide outdoor space for, for their tenants, which um, allows them to increase rents and that sort of thing. And the social benefit, obviously, people are out there socializing. But let's look at the rendering here. Um, there are many ways that you can build a green roof, um, kind of divided into two main categories, built-in place and modular. This image is showing uh, the built-in place variety where all of the layers of the green roof are brought in and placed on site. So you, you put in your waterproof membrane and then on top of that, you put your growing media and then you plant the plants. Um, the, the alternative is to use a modular or tray system where everything is sort of pre-grown inside of a tray and you just bring the trays up on the roof and place them in place. So on day one, you have a fully grown roof. Um, it doesn't matter which of these methods is chosen. Um, edging is important in both of the scenarios, both aesthetically and structurally. So you can see this drawing, um, you've got the concrete roof deck, there's a black uh, waterproof membrane placed on top of that, and then the edging is sitting right on top of that waterproof membrane. And in this instance, on, the, on top of the foot of the edging, you've got uh, a stone ballast, which uh, they're using as kind of a drip strip or walkways along the edge of the roof. And then on the opposite side of the edging, you have your growing media and your plants that are, that are growing. One thing to notice is the drainage holes that are on the wall of the edging. Uh, these holes are important to allow water to move through the edging, preventing standing water from developing at any place on the rooftop. You do not want any standing water ever on the roof. It needs to, to move towards drains. So these holes allow it to continue to move. Uh, let's take a look at a piece of that type of edging. So this would be a green roof edging, very similar to what you're seeing in the picture. Here are your drain holes. Uh, so water can simply pass through in any direction. The base on green roof edging is typically long, particularly for a built-in or built-in-place roof, because you want as much load on top of here as you can to prevent the edging from moving, as you can't affix the edging to the rooftop because that could damage waterproofing. So by having a longer base, you've got more ballast on top, less movement. Uh, 
these bases can be you know different edging works different ways but this uh, can be straight run or it can be manipulated to allow it to form curves so you can do the same designs on a rooftop as you could on the ground all right so let's keep moving along here and let's talk about edging materials uh, when it comes to edging you've got a lot of options um, a lot of different things that it's made out of but we're going to cover a few of the more popular ones here uh, edging and restraints have been around for a long time available in a number of materials and types but let's look at uh, aluminum first uh, aluminum is one of the newer materials actually even though it's been around for 35 plus years uh, it is actually one of the newer popular materials and it is also the most popular uh, landscape and architects landscape architects other specifiers they turn to aluminum as their material of choice in the majority of cases uh, most projects that go down as a specification are specified as aluminum some of the biggest benefits of aluminum are that it remains incredibly durable while maintaining a relatively light weight. So that ratio of durability to weight is, uh, is strongly in its favor. The alloys and tempers that are used for aluminum edging also allow it to be remarkably flexible. And this flexibility allows for smooth curves and nice clean angles without a lot of effort. Uh, if there's any drawback to aluminum, uh, it is that it can be a bit more costly than some of the other materials. However, it can be said its longevity and easiness to work with can save you money in the long run. So even though it might cost a little more, you might be saving more money in the long run by using it. All right, moving on to the next material is steel, another metal. Uh, steel is a popular choice for professional landscapers. People tend to think of steel as being very durable. I mean, when you think steel, you think, okay, it's going to be strong. Uh, and that, and it is. So that's uh, probably its biggest pro. Um, and like aluminum, it comes in a variety of thicknesses for various project types. Uh, downside of working with steel is that it can be incredibly heavy and cumbersome. Uh, that's probably the biggest complaint about steel is just moving it around on a job site can be burdensome, burdensome for the installers. Um, and also forming curves and angles can be difficult um, depending on the thickness of the material as it can be quite rigid. Uh, aesthetically, steel is low profile like aluminum, but it can begin to rust over time. Um, causing it to not look as good as it does on day one. Uh, there can also be some safety issues related to steel due to sharp edges, um, loose stakes, and connections because of the type of stake and connection that steel tends to use. Um, so those are some of the downsides to steel in addition to the fact that it can be quite costly. Uh, it's uh, can be a little, little expensive depending on what area of the country you're in and how close you are to where it's manufactured. All right. Uh, the third one we want to look at here, number three, is plastic edging. Plastic edging is very, very popular, especially in residential applications uh, and then particularly in some geographic areas where certain types of plastic edging are, are very well liked, um, thinking West Coast. Uh, probably the most sold edging material that's out there, and that's mostly due to the do-it-yourself market and the big box stores. Uh, sell a lot of plastic edging at low prices, so a lot of homeowners pick that up for themselves. Um, biggest benefit of plastic is price, like we just mentioned, which is what leads to it being so popular. Uh, it can be found very cheap in many instances. Uh, and it's also uh, another benefit, incredibly lightweight. So it makes it very easy to transport, move around the job site, makes it easier for those homeowners to throw in, in the back of their car, that kind of thing. Biggest downside to plastic edging is that it does not last for long periods of time. Uh, it needs to be replaced every few years due to frost heave, due to uh, damage incurred from landscape equipment, uh, such as mowers or trimmers. Um, 
the thermal expansion properties of the plastics that are used for edging cause them to expand and contract very easily with temperature changes. And that's what leads to it working its way out of the ground um, due to those temperature changes and frost heat. So uh, plastic can also be very difficult to work with. Um, since a lot of plastic comes in rolls, it likes to maintain that shape. So as you try to straighten it or, or get it uncoiled to put it into your landscape, it wants to spring back. So it can be like working with a slinky uh, and trying to get it straightened out into, into your landscape. So that's uh, something that's kind of a downside of it. Uh, it, can, it can get waves or kinks due to those uh, memories. So that is plastic. Let's look at a few more here. Uh, next one we're gonna look at is wood. Uh, a lot of people like wood for its natural look. They think, all right, uh, in this landscape, I want things to look like nature. I want them to be very natural. I'm going to put wood down uh, as my as my edging. Um, and if that's the look you're going for, it, it will definitely succeed. Um, but the downside is that wood will not last indefinitely. Uh, it's going to start to rot. It's going to start to break down and lose its visual appeal over time. Um, so that's uh, kind of one of its downsides. Um, also due to the size, it doesn't lend to a clean look. Um, it's gonna be either thick or above ground. Uh, so if that's not the visual or aesthetic look you're going for, then that's gonna be a downside to you. It's more of a decorative type material. So another option that uh, has become more and more popular over the last decade or so, especially in the Southeast and some of those areas is concrete curbing. Um, concrete curbing can be quite durable, especially in those warmer climates where it's not dealing with freeze thaw. Um, but one of the downsides is that it can be cost prohibitive due to the machinery that's required. Um, these kind of molding and forming machines that the contractors need to purchase um, brings the price up. Uh, it's also, again, kind of like we mentioned with wood, very much more a decorative edging than a functional edging. So it's it's going to be a visual separation, um, but it's also going to be part of the aesthetics, not just a, a clean line. So other options, there are definitely many other type of edgings, uh, anything from fiberglass uh, to, boy, what have we seen? Uh, just using brick pavers or, or concrete pavers as edging lined up in a row. And then, of course, there's also the option to use no edging at all. Um, a lot of people choose this um, where the edges are just left natural or they are cut with a spade or an edger every so often to keep the line nice and clean. Um, yeah, so there we go. That's going to cover most of our edging materials. Uh, of course, you know, there's going to be more that I haven't um, gotten into, but uh, that's kind of the main ones. All right, so this is one of the most important things to remember when you are talking about edging. So if you walk away today uh, in this intro to edging, remembering one thing, remember this line, all edgings are not created equal. Uh, so when looking at your project, uh, looking for an edging or recommending an edging to someone, Keep that in mind. Uh, so you can see on this top here, edging manufacturers use nominal measurements. Um, think about uh, a wood like two by four. Two by four is not actually two inches by four inches. That's just the nominal measurement. Um, and edging manufacturers use the, the same kind of thing. Uh, typically measured by the top bead. So a popular edging size, we looked at a piece earlier, is an eighth inch by four inch flat landscape edging. That eighth inch is considered the size of the top bead. The thickness of the rest of the body of the edging can vary dramatically between manufacturers. It could be anywhere from uh, 52 thousandths of an inch to 78 thousandths of an inch um, in that same one eighth by four inch edging. So when you are looking Let's say you are looking for an eighth inch by four inch edging and you look across many manufacturers and 
you're like, okay, it's all eighth by four. This one is considerably less. Let me go with that one. Remember this, keep this in mind, all edgings are not equal. So find out that information about the wall thicknesses, that sort of thing, and make sure you're getting what you're paying for and getting your money's worth. Um, so various edging manufacturers um, also provide different features. So that's something to consider. Um, you'll wanna look at the wide range of things that are offered, features that are offered, and how that affects the degree of difficulty during installation and how that affects the performance after it is installed. Um, what kind of features are we talking about? So you might wanna consider things like the connection method. How do the pieces connect together at the ends? Uh, the staking method, how do those stakes go in? How long are the stakes? Uh, how are the stakes built? Uh, and then other accessories that could help uh, in your installation and also help it uh, stay in place and look good for longer. Things like um, how, how do they handle grade changes? How do they handle straight lines versus curves? How flexible is the material and so forth? Um, keeping those things in mind when you're selecting an edging will save you a lot of trouble and time in the long run and save you money as well in the long run. And lastly, you wanna consider that even when you're dealing with the same material of edging, uh, like plastic, for example, there may be different uh, recipes or, or methods of making that plastic, different types of plastic, which are gonna yield drastically different results in your landscape as well. Um, for instance, polyethylene and polypropylene, two very popular plastics that are used for landscape edging, they're gonna behave very differently um, with that thermal expansion that we discussed, uh, withholding the, the memory of the shape of if it's coiled or not. Each of those plastics do those things differently. So you're gonna to wanna to keep in mind the actual material of the edging too. Plastic is not plastic, aluminum is not aluminum, et cetera. All right, so, We've given you a lot of information about edging. Um, so how do you choose edging? What are you gonna do to choose the right edging with all of these variations? Uh, let's get into that. Here's a few things you wanna look at. One is performance. You're gonna wanna choose an edging product that is made from a durable material and is loaded with features that will make it perform for the lifetime of your project. You want to make sure it's going to stay there. Why buy an edging that in, is going to come out of the ground and make the project look bad or is going to need to be replaced every so often or it's just not going to do its job. So pick something durable that will last and has the features that will keep it doing what it's supposed to do. Next you want to look at aesthetics. Um, you want to determine the look of the edging that you would like in your landscape. Do you want a decorative edging? Do you, you know, do you want it to, to be part of the decor? Or do you want a functional edging that is not seen, but maintains a, a nice line or keeps things in place? Uh, so that's just gonna be personal style, personal desire. What are you looking for for this project that you're working on? That's gonna help you determine the right edging. Next, availability. Uh, does you no good to select an edging for your project that is not available where or when you need it. Um, you can pick the, the best edging you want, but if you can't get it, it's, it's not gonna help. So you're gonna look at availability and make sure that the edging you select is readily available in your area or can be shipped in in time for when you need it. Next thing you wanna look at is cost, obviously. Um, you could very easily go and select a 24 karat gold edging. I'm sure somebody would be happy to make one for you. Um, and it might look great, but obviously you're gonna have to pay for it. So if it's not in the budget, that's uh, not one you're gonna wanna select. So what are you willing to spend? Uh, and when thinking about cost, remember we touched on this a little bit earlier, it's important to remember the price versus cost equation. Um, you may pay slightly more now, the price might be a little higher, but the cost might be dramatically less over the lifetime of that project, or even by the time installation is done. You know, if you get something really cheap, but it takes you four times longer to install, you may have lost money on the project. So you wanna look at cost, but look at that cost versus 
price equation to make sure you're getting the best deal and saving yourself the most money. Uh, and then the last thing you want to look at, of course, is installation. Um, so how does it install? How easy is it to install? Um, and am I getting the right edging? If I want a straight line, I don't want to get a, a edging that's going to be wavy. You know, I want to get that perfectly rigid edging that's going to save me a lot of money in the installation and look better when it's done. So those are some things to consider when you are choosing your edge. So that is our introduction to edging. I think uh, we've covered everything we discussed, um, various materials, various applications, and the importance of using edging in all of these applications. Uh, so with that, we will um, open up to any questions. If anybody has questions, uh, you can type them into the chat here and we will get to them. We'll give it a couple minutes here to see if they pop up. And if not, then we will uh, consider this good. I will say while we're waiting for these um, questions to come in, if there are any, uh, if you are interested in receiving CEU credits for this webinar, uh, it is available um, through LACES the Landscape Architecture Continuing Education System. And it uh, also is good for a health safety welfare credit. So feel free to email us at sales at permalock.com, sales at permalock.com, and we will uh, get that processed and get your certificate to you so you can get that credit. All right, I am not seeing any questions come in. So with that, I think we will close it out. I want to thank all of you for joining us today. Uh, anyone who was a little late getting in or missed uh, anything, like I said, we will be putting this out publicly um, probably by the end of day tomorrow. So you can start at the beginning and catch up on anything that you missed. And I wanna thank you again for joining us. Um, thank you for checking this out and be sure to look at permalock.com as well if you want more information on any of these types of edging products or if you want more information on the applications we talked about, uh, that is also on permalock.com. So with that, thank you very much and we will be done. Thank you. Have a good day.